Hello, my name is Nazneen Ahmed and I'm a writer and an artist living in Southampton. I'm proud to be a trustee of A-Space Arts, the organisation behind the redevelopment and the reopening of God's House Tower. I'm also a historian and I specialise in researching the unheard voices of, of those in history, particularly the AME people who lived and worked in England in the 19th century, particularly in port cities. So, welcome to my talk for the God's House Towers Beside the Sea Lunchtime Lecture Series. Today I'll be talking a little bit about gentlemen of colour, Indian contingents, Mahometan funerals and uh, more. So I'm a writer who's passionate about um, sharing and uncovering the stories of BAME people who lived in England prior to the 20th century. Because the mid 20th century, 1950s onwards, is widely held to be the time when most um, black and Asian people in Britain arrived to fill the labour shortages that were created by the Second World War. However, actual historical reality is actually quite different and um, there have been black and Asian people living in Britain for centuries and when I first found that out, it really changed my world. It changed the way that I saw myself and how did I belong to Britain and um, it made sense of why my community was here too. Um, and it made me also realise that there's a really close relationship between the British colonisation of other parts of the world, um, slavery and migration. So the renowned intellectual Amba Lavana Sivanandan um, actually once said that um, we are here because you were there, um, you being the white Europeans who undertook slavery, colonisation and conquest of the rest of the globe. Um, and that connection between empire and migration, I think, is most directly felt in port cities such as Liverpool, London, South Shields, Cardiff and, of course, Southampton. So a lot of my research has focused on London and I have uncovered work about and evidence of the religious practices of the South Asian seafarers who worked on the merchant navy ships in the 19th and earliest 20th centuries. These sailors were known as Lashkars um, and they mostly held from Muslim backgrounds and were from South and Southeast Asia. A large proportion of them were actually from what is now known as Bangladesh, which is where my family is from. Um, their ships used to dock in the East India dock in London and some seafarers would jump ship or miss their passage back home due to illness. These seafarers started lodging houses which often had cafes downstairs and these actually were the first Indian restaurants in the area that is now seen as Bangla town and these were the pioneers who led the way for that larger scale settlement of Sileti Bangladeshis in Tower Hamlets post-1945. When I moved to Southampton almost 10 years ago now, I was sure that the city had a parallel history to those other port cities. However, to find these kind of hidden stories involves a long research process of trawling through digital newspapers, archives, using a series of kind of un outdated terms such as coloured, um, in order to f uncover stories that relate to the AME people. Um, I didn't really have an opportunity to do that in relation to Southampton's history until this year and as part of my current residency. So I'm currently writer in residence for Southampton Stories, which is an Arts Council England funded project, which is looking after and sharing um, the collections that we have as a city in terms of our historical objects, our photographic and um, document archives and our photographs. So the project it seeks to introduce the city to various objects in the collection. It also, also encourages people in the city to donate and contribute stories, um, objects and photographs. It, and it is also sharing stories through social media.
through its platform on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. So <clears throat> it's also got its own specially designated gallery in the Sea City Museum downstairs and you can actually get a special ticket to just go and visit that Southampton Stories Gallery and the collections in that um, gallery actually change every three months so there's always something new to see and new things being taken out of the archives and placed on public display. So part of my role for this year as writer in residence is to uncover stories that relate to the AME communities and Southampton today we've got quite a really diverse uh, thriving um, vibrant city with so many um, communities living together um, and that um, is something that I believe that it was always been the case and I've been seeking to uh, find the evidence to support that. So one of the ways I've been doing that is through looking through 19th century regional newspapers which have been digitised and um, doing these kinds of keyword searches looking for words related to um, those of uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds um, using words such as Lashka, using words such as coloured, which we wouldn't use now, but were used commonly in newspapers to refer to people um, in the 19th century. So we have lots of objects in our collection at Southampton Stories. There are over 65,000 objects. Um, and the challenge with such a large collection um, is that it gets catalogued in various different ways and people um, at different points think things have certain kinds of stories attached to them or they don't know them. So it's very hard to locate particular stories um, that might have contemporary relevance um, through using the, the catalogues that we inherit. Um, so um, and, and this is particularly challenging when it comes to BAME communities and um, historic objects. So for example, I'm just going to show you a photograph of a ship which is called the Donera. And this is the steamship Donera. And as you can see from this photograph, um, there are Lashkar seafarers aboard. But um, in our uh, object collections and for Southampton Stories, we do actually have photographs of the ship. We even have part of a logbook of this ship, um, but we don't actually have any other evidence or um, records of the Lashkars being on it. So we have to combine things together in order to tell a fuller story. And so that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do through looking through these newspapers. And um, this is very early research. I've got lots of leads that I need to follow up, but I'm just gonna share a few things that I've discovered um, through that early research with you today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you about um, diff three different categories um, in relation to my, the material I found. So these are fascinating stories that reveal that Southampton wasn't just a gateway to the world, but was actually home to it too. Um, so to the first we'll talk about um, foreign visitors. He often created a lot of interest amongst reporters. He used to um, flock to the docks to take photographs or images um, and, and report on interesting arrivals. Um, the second is going to be about seafarers who were visitors, but who also often ended up being residents and Sotonians. And the third and final section will be about residents. Now this section has the fewest stories which are um, really flimsy little slivers of information but for me they are the most valuable because they actually show us that there was a living BAME community that was present in 19th century Southampton um, and again taking their everyday lives in the city. So. But this is an entirely unknown. So Southampton's a port city and it's had historic ties to the P&O and the Merchant Navy. Um, we know that the Guinea-born salvage driver, diver Jacques Francis lived in Southampton as early as 1545. But for some of the stories I'm going to show you, um, paint a border picture 
of that kind of settlement. Okay. So visitors. I'm going to talk about a couple of cases briefly and then one more detailed. So this is a fantastic photograph and actually um, there's a whole series of these photographs which you can see on the a Autograph ABP website. They have uh, a lot of historic photographs of black people who live in um, London but other places in Britain in the 19th century um, and just looking at them it makes you really aware that um, that Lon play that London and Britain was a very different kind of place to the one we may have imagined in the Victorian period. Um, so uh, this um, is the African Native Choir and um, in my newspaper searches there was actually, I came across an advertisement for a performance that was going to be held um, by this choir um, in 1891 at the Philharmonic Hall in Southampton. So the, the advertisement says, the object of this visit of this choir to England is to interest the public on the social and material progress of South Africa and its native population by the establishment of trade and technical schools for the teaching of manual handicrafts, domestic economy, cookery, nursing and other such useful arts as are essential to the future well-being of the native people of Africa. The performances of the choir are very highly speak spoken of. So this choir was coming to Southampton in 1891. It was part of a very long and extensive tour of the British Isles. They actually performed at the Isle of Wight um, for Queen Victoria um, and um, there are actually even concert programmes for the performances available in the archives at the British Library. And Southampton was one stop on their tour. Um, and it's a really interesting story because when you start to delve deeper about the choir, um, this kind of appearance that is being presented of a quite an exotic um, spectacle um, starts to become more complicated. Um, by um, the stories that come out of the research. So there's so some research that's been done by um, a historian called Veit Alman in his book, Music Modernity and the Global Imagination, which shows that the choirs were actually part of the South African liberal elite. And many of them were actually part of uh, particular colleges in South Africa. And when they went back to South Africa, they actually had illustrious political and social justice careers. Um, but when they were actually in Britain, they were actually seriously exploited by the tour operator. And they were, um, sadly, the musicians were actually abandoned in London when the tour wasn't a financial success. And they were only um, able to go home with the aid of some charities. So um, if, we, if you're really interested in more about this story, um, I'd encourage you to look at Autographs, the Missing Chapter website, and that's got some really um, interesting um, biographies of some of the choir members, as well as other portraits. Um, but this was one of their stops in Southampton. People went to see them sing. And um, one of the things I'd like to do is actually look up with, um, the other regional newspapers and see if there are any reviews or um, any photographs. So that's one thing that I really want to look up. Um, so the other kind of, um, there have been other royal visitors um, and illustrious visitors to Southampton over the 19th century from exotic climes. So the royal family from Nepal came through Southampton on its way to London to visit um, for a royal visit and they brought lots of exotic creatures with them um, and uh, there was an ordnance survey office visit with um, colonial officials and illustrious um, colonial personages um, and um, then there was also a case of uh, refugees arriving in 1857 after the 1857 uprising or known as the Indian Mutiny at the time. Um, these were Euro British um, people who had been 
uh, in India at the time of the Sepoy um, uprising. Um, some of them had lost everything, others had been badly injured, and they had fled India and come back to England and ended up in Southampton where they were given um, some assistance by the mayoress of the time um, before they made their ways um, onwards. Uh, but the story I really want to share with you right now is about the um, royal family of Oud, or Awad as it's now known um, in India. So this is a really interesting story because the visitors didn't just pass through Southampton as many did, but they actually stayed for quite a, for some time at the Royal York Hotel, which was on the above on above Bar Street, kind of where um, Westview Shopping Centre is now. So the arrival of the um, elderly Queen Mother at Southampton docks um, from India caused a great deal of flurry and excitement in the newspapers. Um, and it was quite a moving story because the Queen Mother, who was Muslim um, and elderly, was actually someone who maintained what is known as strict borda, so purda, which we now think of in a, as meaning something very different in terms of elections, actually also relates to um, Muslim women who would live secluded lives um, and would not um, allow themselves to be seen by men who were not part of their family or, or their husbands. Um, so the Queen Mother actually travelled from India to England, um, trying um, on the way with her um, maidservants to maintain Purda. Um, and the navigation of British public space as a secluded, veiled Muslim woman um, was really complex for her. And, but it also create, caused um, reporters and onlookers of the time quite a lot of amusement because you know this wasn't the world's most it wasn't the most welcoming or tolerant place at the time and they um, and some of the reports of of, um, of her arrival do reflect this um, but the story is moving it's not of the Queen Mother coming for a holiday jaunt it's actually a story of the ruthlessness of British imperialism. So the Queen Mother of Oud was um, uh, Malika Kishwa. She came to England not for a leisure tour, but on desperate, urgent business. Um, her son's kingdom was actually annexed to British India um, in 1856. He was deposed and rendered an exile. And she had actually um, forsaken her seclusion to come to England on a mission to address Queen Victoria and appeal for the restoration of her son's rule. Um, so they arrived in Southampton and um, this um, engraving is actually an illustration of them actually trying to navigate Perda um, for um, while well, uh, getting on the train at Southampton. Um, so Perda means that you have to stay veiled um, there were different effort, efforts to um, use sheets to kind of create a tunnel that she could walk through. Um, uh, they didn't really work. Uh, there were other attempts to create a kind of human shield so that she could just walk through um, and with men with their backs turned to her. Eventually she did get onto the train and into her carriage. So they did arrive at the Royal York. They um, One of them... And um, here the story of Oud and Southampton becomes intertwined. Um, so we have this other engraving of the um, of them staying in their rooms in the Royal York Hotel. And while they were staying there, um, they'd come with a large um, kind of uh, group of uh, supporters with them and their staff. And um, what, some of those were British. So one of these British supporters actually ended up standing on the balcony at the, of the Royal York Hotel um, delivering a very impassioned speech to the crowds about um, the royal, royals of Oud's plight. Um, the crowds were um, flocked to see um, the, these Indian royals. Um, there was 
there was a crowd outside the hotel throughout their stay. When they moved, stayed on, went on to London, um, there were reporters and crowds outside the house that they stayed in in Marylebone, all through their 13 month stay in London. Um, so I just think um, that I wonder about those crowds really as a writer. I wonder about them listening to the captain's speech, going home to their families, telling them about it, um, whether it changed their views of the other Asians that they might see in the city, or whether it made them question things about empire. I mean, this is all conjecture, but it's very interesting to me to think about that kind of direct political intervention of the captain broadcasting the plight of the royals in um, to the to the city. But however, the Queen Mother and the Royals of Oud story had a tragic ending, um, uh, which reveals the heartlessness of empire and its cruelty and cost even to the elites of um, of India and other countries. So uh, she she did meet Queen Victoria, but she um, only had a very brief kind of meeting in which she wasn't able to raise the plight of her son um, and then her daughter-in-law who was involved in the uprising the 1857 7 up sepoy uprising actually um, meant that there was no hope for the restoration of rule then the queen wanted, mother wanted to return to india by a pilgrimage to mecca but she was actually refused um, by the British on grounds that her papers were for a state that no longer existed, existed. so she was no longer able to travel um, and she was actually only um, rescued by the French who intervened to allow her to passage to Mecca through France instead but tragically she didn't get to Mecca or all back to India um, and in fact died the day after she arrived in Paris and she's actually buried in the Père Lachaise um, Cemetery in Paris. So now I will talk about another kind of facet of that imperial relationship between Southampton and um, the world, and um, by thinking, talking a little bit more about seafarers. Um, so foreign seafarers travelled into and out of Southampton for, from different countries for centuries, but we're often inclined to think of them as entirely separate from the local population, not having any contact. But we know this isn't the case. Um, um, even the visitors, like the family, the Royal Oud family, um, their kind of staff actually ended up buying a lot of um, produce in the city. The, the Royal Family of Nepal, um, the reports show that um, uh, say that the, their staff actually ended up liking cauliflower and buying all the cauliflower in the city um, for to feed the royal family um, during their time. So their staff, their Indian staff, would have been travelling around the city buying things. Um, they may have actually gone for walks and, and they may have ended up having conversations. Uh, so visitors, even seafarers, do not aren't necessarily just a separate um, population in that way. Um, so um, in London, you know, even though there were efforts to contain foreign um, seafarers um, by main making them stay on deck, whereas the Europeans were allowed to, um, to uh, disembark, um, it didn't always happen. Um, sailors jumped ship, they, uh, they fell ill, they missed their passage back home um, and in London there was even a home for strangers which operated for these stra stranded African and Asian sailors in the 19th century. So, um, the, you know, at points port cities could seem very full of foreign seafarers. Um, one year in London there were seen said to be 2,000 Lashkars uh, living in the city for some time um, and uh, even in Southampton one month there were 400 um, Asian seafarers who were stranded in the city due to their um, uh, company going bust. Um, so, so sometimes uh, a foreign and 
Asian seafarers and African seafarers could actually seem very visible in a port city. Um, and this is one example. So this is an engraving from the Illustrated London News in 1892. And this is actually depicting a procession, a religious procession in East London, um, which is now undertaken by Shia Muslims. It's known now as Muharram. Um, uh, but in the 19th century, it was, um, it was observed by Shia and Sunnis alike. Um, and this is, uh, we, we actually, you can see this is quite a vibrant, carnivalesque type of procession. Uh, Muharram is celebrated quite differently now, um, but we also have evidence that this was celebrated in all kinds of different port cities, from Fiji to Durban, and also uh, in Southampton. So um, that is one element of the religious lives of seafarers, but another element that comes out of the reports and was of much interest to reporters um, was uh, funerals. So seafarers, um, unfortunately, so Asian and African seafarers often had the most dangerous ship jobs on merchant naval ships. Uh, they worked in the boiler room, they worked um, in the engine rooms, um, often um, due to the idea that they could withstand the high temperatures um, better <laughs> because of their, um, their racial backgrounds. Um, and they uh, um, often would fall ill or be injured and um, sometimes die in ports that were not their home ports. Um, in particular with Muslim seafarers, um, it's part of the Muslim religion that you need to be buried as soon as possible after death. So within 24 hours of death, you need to be buried. Um, and this often resulted in Muslim seafarers in particular being buried in ports that were not their home ports. Um, and Southampton, you can, uh, there are reports of various, um, several seafarers of a Muslim uh, belief actually um, being buried in the city. And they were actually buried um, in the in Southampton Old Cemetery, um, which is part of the common. And um, for me, finding these stories was particularly moving. I I run in the city in through that cemetery, and um, I know of the Commonwealth War graves. I know of the graves that are connected to various um, ships, but I had no idea that there were Muslim um, seafarers buried in that cemetery. We have some really detailed articles um, in uh, of about these funeral practices because they were of great curiosity and interest to readers. Um, there's one from 1889 which has two really strikingly different um, depictions in two different newspapers. So in the Hampshire Advertiser it's written with a great deal of, kind of um, racist kind of intolerance and um, it's seen as a kind of ludicrous spectacle and it's quite uncomfortable to read um, as a contemporary uh, reader. Um, but um, the Southern Echo is quite interesting. They, there's a much longer, very sympathetically um, described description. Um, and I'll just read a little bit of that to give you a sense of, um, of, what it, of how they were trying to um, undertake this ritual. During the whole of the following night, the co-religionists of the deceased were engaged in performing the customary rites over his body, such as burning incense, chanting prayers and watching. In accordance with the usual practice among Eastern peoples of burying their dead very quickly, arrangements were made for the funeral to take place on the next day, Saturday, and Mr. Rowthorn of Earls Road, Beavers Mount, was entrusted with the necessary preparations for the last offices. A plain elm was coffin was provided, and in this the body was placed by the deceased friends, whom they themselves did all was necessary. The coffin was covered with a pall of blue cotton material bordered, and upon the lid of it was a plain brass plate, bearing simply the name and the age of the deceased. As the coffin was placed in the hearse, a kind of shuddering moan broke from the lips of the mourners, and then followed the hearse, some in front, 
rank holding onto it as they moved away out of the docks and towards the cemetery. Bringing up the rear of the procession was an open carriage containing Inspector Rowthorne, Docks Company Police, Mr Christie, fifth engineer of the Shannon, who through the Serang or chief man directed the movements and the members of the press who, while the procession slowly wended its way through Oxford Street, High Street and the Avenue. The same chant was sung, one portion of the party replying to the other. When the cemetery came into view, the style of chant was changed. And the um, description ends. The proceedings were watched by a large number of people, but thanks to police arrangements and the general consideration of the public, nothing to interfere with the orderly and quiet observation of the funeral ceremonies occurred. So we can see that there were large crowds who watched this um, funeral um, procession wind its way through the streets of Southampton, down the avenue and to the old cemetery. Um, it must have been quite um, moving to watch and it must have um, been, some, it must have been not so unusual because we have um, reports of various other funerals such as this taking place. Um, but, so um, moving on from that, um, I'm quite, I'm quite excited to, um, about uh, one of the things that I was going to be doing before lockdown happened was uh, working with the Friends of the Old Cemetery Society to really to locate these graves um, and that's something I'm really looking forward to doing once uh, things go back to normal um, and I'm hoping that we can hold some kind of commemorative event um, thinking about the um, sailors um, and seafarers of the AME backgrounds who worked on the merchant naval ships. So, so locals, um, this is the category that I'm most excited about. Um, we have stories and, and information about black families who lived in Shirley at the turn of the 20th century. Um, we have information about Jacques Francis living in 1545. Um, but we, that's as much as we do at the moment. And these little stories that I've discovered are stories of conflicts and scuffles and disagreements because that's what newspapers report. And um, we don't have um, the stories of people going shopping or getting married because they don't sell newspapers in the 19th century. They don't sell newspapers now. Um, but even through those, these kind of flimsy, often law related um, stories, we still can see that um, what were known as then as coloured people were an established part of 19th century Southampton. So we have one example. We have a story of Edward Charles Edsel being indicted for assaulting a Lascar for attempting to steal a watch from his person. So um, the seafarer was actually living in Southampton. Um, they went to a beer shop in East Street and Usan actually refused to pay for beer to the prison, the, the accused. And then he had a watch on him. He, he wound his watch and then um, Edsel actually ended up trying to steal the watch from him. So we've got this case, um, it's quite an ordinary case, um, but it actually shows kind of um, that, that what kind of the social lives of Lascar seafarers, they were just like other sailors and did sometimes drink beer or did frequent those kinds of places, um, or, and that they would get into these kinds of altercations with uh, white European seafarers. Um, and that story is from uh, 1875. Um, another story that I find really intriguing um, is 1885, and I'll just read you the excerpt. Fanny Anno, a wife of a coloured woman, um, living in Russell Street, was summoned for assaulting Clara Collins, another coloured man's wife, 
on Wednesday. It appears that jealousy was the cause of the assault and defendant was fined 10 shillings and 8 shillings and 6 months costs or 10 days imprisonment. So that's a really interesting story to me because it reveals that people in 1885 were having interracial marriages um, and there are actually two women of coloured men who may have been of Asian or African or um, Caribbean heritage um, and who were actually living in Russell Street side by side and they had an argument. Um, so this is such a kind of, this is reported in such a kind of everyday way that it suggests to me that there are others who are living in the city at the same time um, and it also makes sense in relation to research I've done in London um, at, at this very time in London, especially East London, there was a great concern that there were so many interracial marriages happening that there would be a kind of um, a yellow peril that would spread through the cities. That was the what they called it at the time in quite racist language um, of inter mixed race children. So uh, we can see that um, Southampton has the same kind of intermingling of 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 races of, of communities um, happening in 1885. Um, and finally, um, I just want to uh, talk about one other story, and these are these are just a selection. But finally, just this, which I believe might be the first um, incident of um, an anti-racist legal case being brought in Southampton. And it's 1900, and it's um, the headline was The Troubles of a Coloured Man. Yesterday at Southampton Borough Police Court, before GP Perkins and the chair and other magistrates, a case was brought um, in which Louisa Duffin of Lower York Street, Southampton, was summoned by James Hunt of Northern, a gentleman of colour. Hunt charged Duffin with having used insulting language towards him on August the 7th and with assaulting him. Duffin, he said, came to the door of the house where he was lodging, called him a black masher and struck him with her slipper when he told her to go away. Duffin lived in the next street to him and he had previously lodged with her sister. Defendant pleaded guilty to having used the insulting language complained of was fined five shillings and costs eleven shillings and sixpence in all, which he played, paid promptly. So I think that's quite an extraordinary story myself. I think um, James Hunt, who referred to himself as a gentleman of colour, um, living in Northern and actually going ahead with this um, police case, um, uh, giving evidence against this white woman and then actually the the um, the court actually siding with him and charging her for assault is quite a powerful story of um, of claiming space, claiming public space, um, belonging, um, and um, being entitled to uh, rights in in as a gentleman. So I think it's um, for me it's really quite an interesting story, and that's nineteen hundred. Um, so I've just picked a few of the stories that um, I found really interesting um, for this talk. Um, I hope they've been of interest to you. Um, there's a lot more in my research and I hope to share that with you in due course. Um, uh, there's a lot of different leads that I need to follow up. So one is about the old cemetery. Um, but also I'd really like to find out there's a lot of cases of people being jailed or imprisoned for various uh, crimes and I'd quite like to find out if any of them did actually end up in God's House Tower so that's one area that I'm going to look into um, there are the police court records that I need to look up um, but what I wanted to leave you with is the idea that you know these stories are very partial they are reported because they are of interest to a white European British audience um, that they are spectacular or scandalous or are telling particular kinds of narratives and we don't have those everyday lives that go behind 
that are behind these stories, the everyday lives of Fanny Arno or um, James Hunt, we don't know their stories. And this is why I'm a writer of fiction, because I feel that it's only in fiction um, that we can kind of really reimagine their stories and give them voice. Um, and uh, I would just want to um, champion a couple of books that are behind me on my shelf. So by some good friends of mine, oh, this one, which I think uh, is Patrice Lawrence's Diver's Daughter, which is actually the story of Jacques Francis and does feature God's House Tower and other parts of Cheetah Southampton in the book. So it's a book for children. I think it's really important that this history is shared with children because it really um, is important for them to know um, what um, these connections and relationships and this history. Um, and this is a book by um, Catherine Johnson, which is called um, 1783 Freedom, and it's actually a reimagining of a slave rebellion. Um, so these kind of uh, historical uh, fiction reimaginings of, of Britain um, in 19th century, 18th century are really important to enabling us to tell these stories in the full and lived way. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I hope you all stay well and I hope you're enjoying this series of, of lectures by God's House Tower. Bye. Hi, my name is Mia. I'm the Acting Programme Lead at A Space Arts. I'd like to thank you for watching this video and if you can spare a few pennies for GHT, please follow the link in the description below to donate to our PayPal account. The money you donate will help support the organisation through this difficult time and allow us to continue developing content like this to keep us all entertained at home. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here and hitting subscribe and you can watch more quality content from GHT by clicking here. Thanks again everybody and stay safe.